So there's metals, nonmetals, and then they're hybrids. And they fit on that line. So yesterday we said y'all are going to color these down. And that's where we left off on. So whatever, which way you colored this, guys, I mean, this is just a color scheme I'm going to use. Just remember those bottom two rows down here, they're also uh, part of the metal group that we're going to say just to keep things running. Uh, these guys, we actually do not know what the heck they are yet. We don't know if they're metal, non-metal, or metalloid. It's because they don't exist in nature very long. Or actually, they don't exist in nature. Uh, we created them. So if you did color in that last little group down here, it's not that big of a deal. But just know I'm not going to ask you any questions on the test about it. Here are your metalloids. You do need to know these guys precisely, and hopefully you colored them correctly. Anything that touches that line is a metalloid. And on your test periodic table that you get, there is a definite line there. So you don't have to try to figure out where the line begins. It's on there. Um, you need to know that everything that touches the side is a metalloid except aluminum. That's the only catch on that little line. And what a metalloid is is that they share properties of both metals and nonmetals. Okay? One of the most special ones that we're going to talk about is silicon. No, not silicone. People think silicone is an element. It's not. Silicone is a polymer. Silicon is what you put in your microchips and things like that. And we're going to talk about why it's so special. So metals. Let's talk about metals. These are all your properties you need to know about these guys. To the left of the stair-step line, we take everything down to the stair-step line, um, and then we break everything down from there. And you got that nice little, I know some of y'all are in the front, y'all can actually see that periodic table that kind of helps out a little bit to identify those metalloids. Um, but anyway, you need to know this, some of the properties I can always ask. The majority of the periodic table, and I'm going to say about 80 to 90% of the periodic table is metal, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. There's very few nonmetals and metalloids on there. So all of them are solid at room temperature, which is actually kind of funny, except for mercury. Mercury is actually the only liquid metal we have. All the other guys are actually, you know, they're tough. They're solid. Uh, most of them are usually silver colored. It's kind of crazy, but there's only few that are not silver colored. Copper, for example. Some people say, well, what color is copper? Y'all say, bronze or you might use the word brown or copper like most people are like oh I really don't know we actually call that a red metal it's really weird uh, it's just so lustrous that it looks kind of like well the color that we know is bronze it's really weird uh, but most of it is silver even the uh, sodium and uh, potassium and all that those are actually silver metals and we'll show you what they look like they're very soft those guys are um, you can cut them like butter but they're also highly reactive. So uh, very good conductors, which means they heat up really easy and they conduct electricity very well. Which one, uh, by the way, which one of the metals is the number one uh, conductor? It is gold. Uh, some people think copper because most of your pots and pans are, that are really good are made from copper or they have a copper core. But uh, why don't we use gold in our pots and pans? It's, it's expensive. It's rare. Um, same thing about platinum. We would use platinum in a lot of stuff, but it's actually very rare. It's a, one of the best catalysts on the planet. So heat and electricity, very good conductors. Malleable and ductile. You need to know these two definitions. They are pretty good test questions. So I don't usually do definitions, but these two I'm going to say you need to know. And it's very easy to remember these two. Malleable, if you think of a mallet, which is a hammer, that means you can hammer them in the sheets. And if you think about metals like aluminum or gold or you know, lead or even uh, copper, you can make little sheets out of these things. You can pound them in the sheets. Most of the time we just melt them and let them form. Uh, ductile means you can be formed into wires. If you're more of an engineering kind of person, you already know these two definitions because they are very, very common in carpentry and things like that. So here's some pictures of some of these guys. Uh, you said now some of these uh, are called bronze, uh, steel, brass and things like that, those are not elements, those are combinations of metals come together. Uh, when they first started making weapons and things like that in the Bronze Age, they didn't know actually what they had. Um, they didn't realize that there's some copper mixed in there. So until they actually started filtering some of these guys out, they were actually able to make some of these pure forms. Steel is a combination of many metals, and you get the right combination together, you can make a pretty sturdy metal. All right, now for non-metals. We always do metal always last. 
So nonmetals is just as you said, total opposite. They lie to the right of the stair step line. Please do also include hydrogen. People sometimes forget about that guy. He doesn't have a family, unfortunately. He's adopted. He's also the most simplest element on the periodic table. These guys are not really shiny. We do like to put them in you know, light bulbs and stuff to make them light up, but uh, on their own, they're not very shiny at all. They can be a liquid, solid, or gas. All gases are nonmetals on the periodic table, but not all nonmetals are gases. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. Just like all thumbs are fingers, but not all fingers are thumbs. Metaphor. All right, moving on. So the variety of temperatures that they actually have depend on what these guys can actually do. Um, many different colors. So they're not very plain like a metal is. Um, by the way, when I say shiny, I might use the word luster also. Luster is what we mean by shine. You gotta think about now your jewelry. Most of your jewelry is made out of, well, metals and diamonds. Um, only one part of it is non-metal is basically the diamond part. So various colors, many different sizes, poor conductors of heat and electricity. Now I say poor. I didn't say they don't conduct. They do. They just do a very bad job at conducting. I don't know if y'all knew this, but in fluorescent lights, that's what's inside them is a gas. When you send electric current through it, it's making those electrons jump inside that gas. That's how they light up. They're also very good uh, at energy efficiency. They last a long time. That's why everybody's moving to those little weird bulbs nowadays. But anyway, they're also very, very brittle. They're not very sturdy. You can actually crack them very easily. There are some metals that are not as sturdy, but these guys basically fall apart. You can crunch them up in a powder and things like that. And here are some pictures. What's the stuff in the upper left-hand corner? What's that yellow stuff? That's sulfur. Nasty, stinking like egg sulfur. The stuff in the middle is iodine. Uh, it does kind of look purple unless you put it on uh, starch. It actually looks kind of blue. The stuff in the upper right-hand corner is what we, th I think it is, it looks like chlorine gas to me, but it, then again, hey, it could be um, sulfur dioxide and thing, other things like that. Bottom right of corner, obviously, is argon. We take those noble gases and we can actually put them in different, uh, you've seen like different light up lights around like billboard signs, or not billboard signs, but outside like certain restaurants. Uh, that's what they have inside those, is actually different noble gases. The black stuff in the bottom, that is very important. Coal. Coal, which is mostly composed of one element. What's the only black stuff you have left over when you burn stuff? Ash. Ash. We call that something else. Think of one of those non-metals up there. It is carbon. Okay, so this is a, a third thing. I, I say like many things throughout the year that th this is very important that you're going to take with other units. So this is the third thing. The first thing I said was the law of conservation matter. The second thing was the octet rule. The third thing is these guys. I'm only mentioning these once and they're going to be important the rest of the year, especially in the unit, well, unit five and unit six and all this kind of stuff. We call these guys the, um, the diatomic elements. The diatomic elements um, basically mean they can't be by themselves. So there are seven and they're easy to memorize. All you need is a periodic table. You'll notice I have them in a pattern up there. You got hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. They are the ones that are actually in a little L shape, um, or upside down L shape, kind of like in Tetris, but uh, I digress. Anyway, there are seven of them, and they make a seven on the periodic table. That's how I memorized them. By the way, don't get them confused with the noble gases. Noble gases do not do this. They don't bond with anybody. But these guys can't be by themselves. They have to bond to somebody. In other words, you've heard me say you can't see oxygen by themselves or hydrogen, you'll always see it as oxygen, not just as O, you'll see it as O2. Or you'll see hydrogen as H2. Same thing with nitrogen. You can't see nitrogen by himself. He has to be bonded to somebody. So if he's not bonded to another element, he's going to bond to one of his own buddies and be into. That's what it means to be diatomic. Same thing with fluorine. Same thing with chlorine. Same thing with bromine, or bromine, and uh, iodide. They're all going to be diatomic if they're not bonded to somebody. And you're like, well, wait a minute. What about H2O? Okay. Well, here's the thing. Water, those are already bonded to something. I'm saying you can't just have H by itself. 
it has to be H2. When you go to a hospital and you see somebody on an oxygen tank, it does not say O, it says O2, okay? So that's what it means. So be sure you know the difference between those guys. So for example, if I said iron, it could be by himself. He's not one of the diatomic elements. So you can have iron by itself. You can have copper. You can have cobalt, uh, sodium. You can have all these guys by themselves. It is these seven guys who cannot be by themselves. They have to bond to somebody. Now, don't get them confused with noble gases. Noble gases are gases, yes. Some of these are gases also, or most of them are. So my advice to you is this. If you're trying to figure out those seven, cover up the noble gases and you'll see the little pattern. You'll see H-N-O-F-C-L-B-R-I. How I memorized it, I said, uh, I came up with my own little German word. I called it Hanofklebri. 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 To me, that was easier to memorize than the other thing. So metalloids, they're hybrids. They consider properties of both these guys. So they're not so much metal and they're not so much non-metal. They're kind of in between. Uh, they are brittle, um, but they're not very malleable either. Um, they're kind of in between. Now I will say this, silicon I'm gonna use as the main example here. Um, some people think aluminum is a metalloid, but because it's a very poor metal, uh, and it's, very, it's one of the most, it's, oh, it's very plentiful on the planet. We use it in everything, uh, even cooking. And some of you are like, but I will tell you this, aluminum is a poor metal. It is crappy at conducting. And you're like, well, why do we cook with it? Well, you really just use it to keep moisture in your casseroles and things like that. That's why you cover them in the oven. But in fact, you can actually, you might see some around Thanksgiving and time when they're taking things out of the oven. So it might grab the aluminum foil right out of the oven. Uh, that's because it does not conduct heat very well. It's very, very, you know, poor. It'll be warm a little bit, but as soon as you touch it, like poof, the heat disappears. It will conduct electricity, but it does not do a very good job. Hence the name poor metal. Uh, also, anyway, they call these guys semi-metals or semiconductors, things like that, because they do conduct electricity, but they don't conduct too much to where they overheat. That's why they're just perfect for microchips. That's why uh, silicon is going to be the one we talk about a lot. He is like right in the middle. He's perfect. Anyway, do not this. Aluminum is not a metalloid, even though it touches stair step line. He's the only one. Uh, he is actually full out metal. He has all of the properties, and that's the reason why. Now we're going to talk about each family. We're going to go through this as quickly as possible because um, honestly, it's interesting. It's really fun. Um, so we're going to talk about each family, what they are useful in society how we use them in industry, uh, and I'll even throw in a little extra tidbits here and there. But I'll try to keep it as short as I possibly can. Uh, so first off, we're gonna start with group one. Actually, I'm gonna show you a periodic table. I like using this one, it's color coded, so it kinda gives an idea. You'll notice on one periodic table, they have that stair step line, but you don't see where they highlighted metalloids. Uh, basically, if they're below the line, we consider them mostly metal, and we'll call them like a poor metal, but if it's above the line, we consider them mostly non-metal. But if they touch the line, they're a metalloid. Um, anyway, so do remember about the solid liquid gas. Uh, again, if you ever need to figure out what the state of matter they're in, they're on this periodic table behind you. You can draw them on your other periodic table if you want, but they're kind of easy to memorize. There's only two liquids, and the gases are pretty self-explanatory to look at, noble gases. That's why they're called noble gases. They're all gases. But however, the synthetic ones are a little bit more interesting. And some people have asked me, well, how the heck do we make the synthetics? Okay, do we just, we got to use a particle accelerator. And so that's what I'm gonna show you real quick is how, to, uh, how this particle accelerator works. So basically what this whole little process does is, I kind of like it, the reason why I thought Mario Kart, because if you ever played the game, you, there's boosters. You know what I'm talking about? You hit the booster and it's like, whee, you go faster. All right, well, same thing. Uh, with the particle, though, they keep it going in a circular path, which is smart because, well, you're just going in a complete ring. You're not having to go straight every time because eventually you're going to hit an end. Well, with the ring, they're going to go move faster and faster, and they're going to get faster every single time, and soon enough, they're going to hit a top speed. Uh, and they got to get them very fast, otherwise they can't get those nuclei to clash into each other. Because normally, if you try to clash them together, they're going to repel. There's a lot of forces, and molecular forces, where they bounce off each other, okay? But if you crash them together at very, very high speeds, they're going to be forced 
to stay together. But this is another reason why they only exist for very few seconds at a time. All right, so let's talk about each of these groups and what you need to know about these guys. These are some nice little questions I'm going to give you. Um, so a lot of the art that you see on the side here, some teach, uh, not teacher, but some students actually asked me about the art. Uh, there's a artist out there who took every element off the periodic table and put a personal, uh, a personality to it. And that, a little fact with each one. And it's actually very interesting. And the link that you see up there in the upper left-hand corner would take you to that. And it, it's really kind of cool to look through. She has every single element up there. She's had to redesign some of them. Um, but they're, they're really kind of cool. They help you kind of get a good idea of what's, what they're all used to. Um, so anyway, alkali metals, group 1A. Now do realize hydrogen is adopted. He is not a metal, okay? But he's an adopted group. Uh, he is very explosive. And if you think about the H-bomb or if you think about the Hindenburg, uh, that was one of the little things that actually happened with uh, using hydrogen gas. Um, it's also mainly used in water, and it makes up the majority of the planet. It's the most simplest atom out there. But the alkali metals, enough talking about hydrogen, we can always talk about him way later. But alkali metals, what you need to know is this. I'm going to use words like very, very um, on this first group. Very, very reactive with air. We have to keep it in a contained, if we have the pure metal itself, we've got to keep it contained in the oil. The reason why, because if it reacts with the water in the air, it will blow up. Soft enough to be cut with a knife. It's really kind of cool. It's like butter that you just took out of the fridge. If you cook a knife and cut it, it works just the same. Uh, must be stored on a mineral or a tell job, protective against moisture and air. Uh, as ions, sodium and potassium are the essential electrolytes in your body. Not just one, but the other. Potassium is really important, but sodium is also. These also help kind of help retain water, um, help send electric current, things like that. So if you've ever had, if you're an athlete and you ever got really, really dehydrated, you'll notice that uh, you can't just drink water. You need electrolytes to go with it. That's why Gatorade and Powerade are so essential for you, or why they became such a big thing. They actually help replenish some of those electrolytes that you need makes you feel like you also got more energy, but that's the sugar in there. All right, so anyway, some other compounds commonly found are that you can find these guys in. Obviously salt, table salt. There's also potassium chloride, which is also another type of salt. It's for health nuts. Um, some people put that on their food. You can actually eat it just like table salt. Uh, NAC, uh, NACL03, which is bleach. Uh, and I always tell people this, when you go to college, take bleach with you. Trust me, especially if you stay in the dorms. Anyway, other thing is baking soda. Uh, Y'all will be playing with some baking soda later. We're actually going to be turning baking soda into table salt later. Um, and you're like, how can you do that? Well, it's magic. Not really. It's very easy, actually. Um, last thing, uh, last but not least, is lithium carbonate. Uh, it's it used to be used to treat manic depression. It still is today, but in different kind of doses. And the reason why, uh, back in the day, they used to put it in 7-Up. It used to be the main ingredient in 7-Up. That's the reason why it's called 7-Up. It was meant to perk you up, to make you not depressed. Um, they still had to remove it a little bit. I find it kind of ironic uh, because there is a song by the musical group called Nirvana um, called Lithium. And, you know, Kurt Cobain was the lead singer in that. And also he uh, apparently killed himself with all right, next one. Alkaline earth metals is the yellow group that we see. Uh, we're going to take a look at these guys now. Not much to write. They are not as reactive. They are reactive, but they're not like deadly reactive. Uh, most of the ones we're going to talk about is magnesium sulfate, uh, was actually inside Epsom salts. The, they're not bath salts. They're what you would use to soak your feet in and things like that. They're very actually nice. Uh, there are some medicinal purposes to that kind of stuff. Uh, calcium carbonate, limestone, marble, chalk, all these kind of stuff, that's where we mostly get that kind of stuff. Anyway, transition metals. So anyway, transition metals, these are all your bees. Uh, there are tons to actually talk about. Mainly they make up the whole traits that we talked about of an idea of a metal. So when you think of metals on the periodic table, these are the guys that usually pop in your brain first. Iron, number one. Right off the bat, most people think of that. Gold, silver, copper, things of those sorts. Um, iron is important for you because it's necessary for oxygen transport in your blood. Um, not in your red blood cells, that is. It's also the thing that gives your structure, and I'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, iron is also a primary building metal in society. It's used to 
massively makes steel. Uh, chromium is used as a protective coating. So I told you how they take steel and they put different kind of metals inside it. Well, they put chromium in there for anti-corrosion and things like that. Um, they put nickel in there for flexibility so it doesn't snap. Tungsten is used in incandescent light bulbs. It's also what's being used in the projector above your head right now. It's what gives off a nice little bright light. Uh, it's also what my wedding ring is made out of. It looks like platinum, but it's really not because, well, tungsten is a lot more cheaper. Uh, and it's shiny. So most people think it's actually uh, platinum, but it's not. Platinum's a little bit more tan. Uh, titanium is a, oh, or they also thought it was titanium too. Titanium is a very strong light metal. We use that to make, used to make the space shuttles out there because, well, it's a metal that's strong and it's light. Hence the name titanium after, well, the name Titan. Um, anyway, so that's the main things to actually know. Uh, I just pulled up a few examples up there. They pretty much repeat left and right. Okay, so hemoglobin. Uh, this is what's in your blood cell. And I will say this, uh, just as a health kind of thing, a lot of people, students don't know about things they could do to help out with themselves. Mainly I'm talking to the ladies here. You ladies need to be sure there is a difference between women vitamins and men vitamins. Women, y'all need women vitamins. Here's the reason why, is because there's iron in it. And women need iron, not men. Uh, if you take iron in men, uh, you're gonna get your joints clogged with iron deposits. And I forget what that condition's called, but like basically, it's kind of like you get weird knuckles, really, really bad knuckles, and you don't want that. Uh, but women need a lot for the blood in their iron. I'm sorry, the iron in their blood. Uh, it helps keep the structure going, especially also if you're uh, Hemophilia, thank you. And um, what was the other thing? Anemic, Anemic thank you. Uh, that's very, very important. And you can get a lot of this stuff from red meat and tomatoes. Anything that's red that's a food, it has pretty much iron in it. And that's what gives it its color, is the red color. Uh, most people think the iron is in the very middle given the donut shape of the red blood cell, but that is not true. Uh, the proteins that are inside give it the little structure. That's the little dip that you see in the middle. The hemoglobin is this thing. It's what keeps all these little proteins together. If you have a genetic condition to where it doesn't make some of these structures, well, synthesized correctly, these are all proteins. If I like remove one of these little chunks out of the way, that kind of looks like a uh, curved shape, giving you another condition, which is usually called sickle cell, sickle cell anemia. That's one reason why that they still carry oxygen, but they don't carry as much as they need to. It used to be very tough, but now there's actually a lot of treatment for it now. There are a lot of enzymes out there to help you produce a full cell. So it's amazing how far medicine has actually come. This is actually what uh, the heme actually looks like on a molecular standpoint. Iron's right smack in the middle. You remove that iron molecule, well, and then everything falls apart. Uh, chlorophyll looks just like that, except instead of iron in the middle, it's magnesium. And if you remove the magnesium out of the chlorophyll, it, the leaf starts turning, instead of green, to brown. That's why they actually brown. All right, uh, so let's move on to the other guys. Lanthanide series, these are actually very short. We'll get to carbon, probably start slowing down. Um, so lanthanide series, one thing to know about these guys, they are not very, they're a little radioactive, but not as much as the next group we're about to talk about. Uh, we very rarely use these guys. I hate to say it, but we don't use them in a lot of stuff. Uh, that's why you're probably not very familiar with a lot of their names. All right, so moving on. <laughs> uh, actinide series, the second row of the F block. These are the only interesting thing about these guys. When you think of radioactive, that's these guys. Most of them are synthetic. Uh, we already watched that video last go. I forgot I actually put that one in here. Uh, but what's great about this is uranium. Um, or, and also, well, some other radioactive ones. The fuel efficiency of these guys that are right there. They're kind of like silicon. They're kind of perfect for microchips. But these guys are actually just perfect for energy production. Uranium has a good value of about 50 years before you have to, you know, get another cell of it. Uh, it's clean energy. Some people say it's like it's not clean, but it's a lot more clean than natural gas and uh, coal. And it produces tons of energy. Um, it's fantastic. It really is. So the only problem is this. Once you use it, you can't reuse it. You have to go dump it somewhere in a lead box uh, so nobody can use it to make a bomb. Uh, it's still what, what they could be used as a dirty bomb, and, uh, you, but you can use other you know, radioactive materials for that. For example, when you go to the dentist, there's some radioactive materials they have. 
uh, there's no reusable thing for them. They have to go dump them either. <laughs> I've heard them talking about shooting them in outer space, but most of the time they just end up burying them in a desert somewhere where people can't go to. Anyway, as you can see, the comparison, if you were to look in terms of per kilogram, uh, that's a lot of energy per just one little kilogram of uranium. Compared to even your fat that you have on your body, that's what they're having up there, has a certain amount of energy to it. But it's really kind of cool. Uh, anyway, going back to all this other kind of stuff, let's move on to more of the poor metals kind of part. We'll talk about boron's family. So the whole group, even though now we're starting to segregate into including some uh, metalloids, uh, so we're going to start seeing some of this start kind of overlapping. So boron family, which is 3A, uh, aluminum is found in this family too, but that's where we get aluminum. It's mostly found in clay. All right, carbon family, I'm going to start kind of uh, slowing down on some, uh, some of this kind of stiff. So carbon is one of the most important parts of them. I mean, this is one where we're going to split to many different things. And I hate to tell you ladies, but uh, diamonds are not rare. This is the heartbreaking point. You don't really care because they shine, uh, but they're as about as plentiful as aluminum. We make diamonds in the lab. They're used in drills to drill down and get oil. You cannot tell the difference between a synthetic diamond and a real diamond. They're exactly the same. They look exactly the same. You can make them the same way. Uh, anyway, carbon's in everything. It's kind of hard to imagine that the stuff that's putting you together is the same stuff that's in a diamond. Uh, there is... <laughs> This is the crazy part. Did you know that there's actually a place or a website where you can take your loved one's ashes and make them into a diamond? Yeah, it's real. Uh, you can take their hair too if you really want to. So if you're like guys, if you're going to marry somebody and you really want to impress the woman, you could take their hair and actually cut off hair and you can act, they can actually put it into a diamond. But uh, yeah, anyway, all it is is basically coal. If you put a lot of pressure under it and a lot of heat and pressure, it turns into a diamond. Uh, anyway, okay, going on to the rest of the stuff. We spent a whole thing on just carbon because carbon is very important. There's a whole chemistry based on it called organic chemistry. Uh, silicon is actually used to make also glass. You, if you want to know where to find all the silicon, uh, sand on the beach is the best place to actually use. You can actually take sand and make it into glass. Um, Tin is a very common metal used in there. It actually acts more as a transition metal than it does a, one of the metals that we have over there. Lead is a very poisonous metal, uh, previously used in gasoline and paint. Uh, I have the quote down there from Tommy Boy. Did you ever eat paint chips as a child? Uh, Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> that is a funny movie. All right, let's go ahead and wrap up some of the rest of these, and then I can knock this puppy out. All right? Real fast, up and real fast, We're going through nitrogen groups, really fast. 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen gas. That's the upper part that you're not really breathing very hard. Ammonia is NH3. That's what you use to clean, actually, your windows and things. It gives that nice, street-free shine because it evaporates. H3PO4 is phosphoric acid. It is found in your soda, along with carbonic acid and things like that. It's a preservative. Anyway, nitrogen group, that's pretty much it. Five valence electrons. Next group over is oxygen family. Oxygen family is group 6A. Uh, very is also not a very reactive group, but it is reactive. Oxygen, pure oxygen will, uh, well, I don't want to say explode, it's very flammable. It increases the flammability. And y'all did that in the lab when you switched the uh, barrel on, you added more O2, therefore giving a stronger flame. Uh, makes up about 20 to 21% of the uh, atmosphere is what you're breathing. Uh, if you keep going up, the oxygen atoms get so concentrated they make ozone. That's what actually protects you from UV radiation. Without ozone, uh, because of the CFCs that we had back in the 60s and hairspray and you know, some of the crop things that they were using actually depleted some of our ozone, which is one reason why they say most people are getting more cancer now. Um, sulfur is a so, uh, yellow solid used in medications. It used to be used in all medications. Now, some of y'all, when you first go get an antibiotic, they try sulfa, which is a component of sulfur to treat your infection. Uh, some of you, most people, or about half of uh, people are allergic to sulfur, and you'll have red dots pop up on you. Sulfur gives uh, fool's gold its color. It looks like gold, but it is not dense whatsoever. It is also, uh, it's very shiny like gold, but not. It also has a bad rotten egg smell. So we're down to the last two guys we're going to talk about, and you already know about most of these guys. I'm going to slow down on this next group because it is also a very reactive group. This group is called the halogens. 
And uh, remember me talking about fluorine, the most attractive element on the periodic table? Well, she also got a little bit of a temper. Um, it will pretty much eat almost anything. That's why it is the most corrosive out there. Um, it's very attractive. It pulls, it strips electrons away and pulls the atoms with it, making it everything fall apart. Um, anyway, moving on. Chlorine gas is actually very poisonous. You breathe it in, you die. However, if you mix sodium, which is very explosive, with chlorine, which is very poisonous, you get something that you put on your food every day. Salt. Hmm. We'll talk about why it doesn't kill you immediately. We already talked about bleach. Iodine is actually in, uh, put in table salt to ionize it. I'm sorry, iodize it. Duh, I always forget the D. Uh, since we don't get enough iodine in our regular diet. And that's actually to prevent other kind of like, you know, uh, I think it's the thing that grows in your thyroid and stuff like that. Um, fluorine is actually found in toothpaste. That's what keeps your teeth clean is the fluorine inside it. Now there's also fluorine in your water to help strengthen it. Um, it's a little poisonous in small doses. Uh, I mean, large doses is very poisonous, but they put a little bit in there. And it strengthens your teeth. That's why it's in every single thing of toothpaste. Yeah, that's why you shouldn't eat it. Yeah. That's why you're supposed to spit it out. Uh, but it's great. It pulls the stuff right off your teeth, the gunk and stuff. Uh, the last group is noble gases. Inert, you need to know that definition. Okay, we talked about malleable and ductile. This is another definition you got to know. Inert means does not react, unreactive. I know it's a weird, nerdy word, but you got to know it. Uh, argon is approximately 1% of the atmosphere is actually the rest of the old percent. We use helium in balloons. Liquid helium is also used as a coolant. However, we're running low on it. And neon emits a bright color when excited. That's what we use, hence the name neon signs or neon lights. That's where it comes from. It's actually using the element neon.